My name is Olivia Carvel and I'm the Vice President of the New York Financial Writers Association. I'm going to give you a few fun facts about NIFWA. We've been around for 81 years and we're the oldest financial journalism association in the country. We regularly host events like this with inspiring financial reporters like David Jeans and Angel O. Young who are joining me tonight. And we also hand out scholarships to aspiring financial reporters, those who want to one day write stories like this one. Um, so if you want to join NIFWA or become a member, just come up and chat afterwards. We're always looking for new members. And we really appreciate you all coming out tonight. Um, it's my honor to introduce you to our panel, David, who works at Forbes, and Angel, who's with the Wall Street Journal. So they wrote this remarkable book, um, it's called Wonder Boy, Tony Shea, Zappos, and the Myth of Happiness in Silicon Valley. If you haven't read it, you should. It's an incredible story about a billionaire tech visionary and his tragic pursuit for happiness. But it's also a story about more than that. It's about mental health, addiction, social climbers, enablers. It's about how greed, power, ambition, and ego can lead us to do some truly awful things. And I am really excited to talk to David and Angel about how they turned their beat reporting into this book. Um, we're gonna open it up to audience questions at the end. We don't have microphones. It's pretty casual and conversational, so feel free to just put your hand up if you wanna ask anything. Um, but I wanna kick off with the genesis of the book. You were both reporting at Forbes and you were assigned to cover Tony Shea's death. Um, can you explain what you knew of Tony Shea at the time and why his death was such a big story? Um, well, so David was on the tech team at the time, um, and I was sort of straddling both the tech and what we call the wealth team at Forbes, which is the team that looks into the wealthiest people in the world. Um, and Tony was always on the radar because he was not necessarily the richest person in the world, but definitely up there. And that's just the type of person that Forbes looks at. Um, and David and I, we had been working on a story about a tech company that was based in Vegas a couple months prior to Tony's passing. And so from that story, we got to know some Vegas-based sources. And so when Tony passed away, those sources started reaching out to us and saying, hey, are you looking into Tony's passing? There are all these rumors floating around in downtown Vegas, um, and we want answers because Tony was a beloved figure in downtown Vegas, and there was just a lot of questions. Um, Can you talk a bit louder? Oh, yes. Um, you yeah, I can talk louder. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that that was certainly one thing that was happening, but also there was a, like, it's a very competitive story at the time, and there had been the Daily Mail was coming out with stories about how he had had a you know, terrible drug-fueled La Final days and all this salacious stuff about, you know, sleeping with lots of women and uh, that narrative was taking over and I think at that time there was a lot of unanswered questions about his death uh, and some of the rumours that Angel and I had started hearing from some of our sources was that, which at, at the start seemed totally wild, which is how most good stories always start and like we had been hearing that there had been ransom payments out, uh, he'd been kidnapped because of a drug deal gone wrong, like all sorts of stuff that didn't align with like a tech billionaire kind of character. So effectively, while we were hearing this, our editor-in-chief, Randall Lane, was like, you know, also just sort of, he sort of pulled us in together and was like, okay, we need to figure out exactly what's going on here. And your angle, to, like the angle that we could really come up with here was like, okay, the Daily Mail and everyone putting out these you know, pretty phenomenal tabloid headlines. If you want to like, we realized that we could reach out to people who knew Tony and say, hey, we understand there's probably a much more nuanced portrait to be told here and we're gonna be the people who are gonna do it. And that line resonated widely. And Angel and I, Angel took Reddit and I took Twitter and basically just found any person who'd been talking about Tony, said he knew him, oh, I miss him, all this sort of stuff. So we had a, we started working, uh, Tony passed away on the Friday after Thanksgiving. We started making calls on the following Wednesday at around noon. And then um, we 
I think that the, by the next day, we actually had uh, the, the letter. As the story that we ended up publishing uh, was widely read because we had a letter uh, written by the singer Jewel, who was a good friend of Tony's, and she wrote a very sort of fateful note to him saying, the people around you are going to be complicit in your death, you're in trouble, and it was very haunting. And it was a good way to frame the story, but once we realised that, we realised that we had a very compelling piece to put forward, and effectively what we did was string together all the voices that we had, had gathered in about two days. We had in interviewed about 20 people, and then just strung through a TikTok of his life with the letter at the top, and it was a pretty, the story writes itself, obviously, and I think that that came out about 48 hours after we had started working on it, and then, yeah, I mean, just the, the last thing I'll say on that is once the story came out, it was, you know, it was the story of the, of the day, obviously, and um, that was effectively also when agents and publishers started reaching out. Right. So I, I just want to read out a little bit of the letter that Jill wrote to Tony because I think that's what really resonated with the readers. She said, I'm going to be blunt. I need to tell you that I don't think you are well and in your right mind. The people you are surrounding yourself with are either ignorant or willing to be complicit in you killing yourself. <clears throat> so how did it feel to find such an explosive piece of information where she's essentially prophesying that he's going to die and months later that came to pass I think it was one of those so David just kind of told you the timeline that we were working on it was a very very short timeline and so I'm sure you've been through this before where you're just reporting the hell out of a story and you find a piece of information and you almost don't even have enough time to process it so that's what it felt like when we first got our hands on the letter. So we got the letter, we read it through, I started moving on to the next reporting stage, and then David was like, wait, wait, wait. We need to like, process this letter. Mm -hmm. And the source that gave it to us, he basically said, if I give you this letter, this is your story. Mm -hmm. So are you ready to publish this? And I said, <laughs> um, I guess I have to read it first. Um, but it was, like, it sound, I think it sounds dramatic, but in the moment, I don't think we, like, I, at least I didn't fully understand, like, what I'm pretty sure I said, let's start writing. Yeah, so, like, so I sent the letter to him, and he, and he read it. He was like, we need to start writing right now. And yeah. I was like, okay, let's, let's start writing. Um, and so I think after we started writing, that's when I got to the point where I was like, oh, okay, this letter is kind of a game changer. Mm -hmm. um, but David got there before me, I'll have to admit. <laughs> and so the story comes out, and it's the most read story of the day, obviously. Everyone reads it. I remember where I was sitting when I read this. And then agents and publishers start reaching out to you both. Can you explain what that felt like? And had you had any experience working with agents or publishers before? Absolutely not. Um, when we got the first emails, I didn't take them seriously. I read them, I didn't really, I just, I, there was just so much going on and we hadn't slept like all night and it was immediately that we got to reach out from a publisher, we got to reach out from two agents and I was reading these emails. I think we asked what's the difference between an agent and a publisher? We had no idea. <laughs> what is the difference? Well, so an agent is supposed to be your advocate in um, any kind of deals that you sign, whether it's a book deal or a movie <coughs> deal, they take 10 to 15 percent of everything. Um, and they're supposed to be your advocate. And then the publisher, that's the house that has the editors that will help oversee the actual book project once you start getting uh, <coughs> getting started on it. And um, any proceeds that you get is from the publisher, mm -hmm. not the agent. Is it normal for publishers to reach out to no. journalists? No, and so we didn't know that until we started talking to the agents and we told the agents who was reaching out to us and one of them said, oh, you shouldn't be talking to the publisher on your own. Like, you need an agent. Um, but yeah, I think we... Even the publisher said, you should have an agent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, it all happened so fast and I remember where I was when I called you to talk about yeah. whether we should do this or not. Yeah. And um, I think... There was a part, just because the story is a really heavy topic, and even in reporting out the magazine story, 
we were talking to sources who were extremely emotionally charged. Mm. So the idea of working on a story like that for X number of years and continuing those conversations was definitely something worth thinking about. Mm. Is this a story worth putting that much time, effort, and emotion into? Mm. Um, so we talked it out and um, so it's not like the moment the agents or the publishers reached out, you guys were all in, let's go. You needed to take, you know, like, kind of pause and sit with it for a bit and contemplate what that would look like. Yeah, I think that there's, like, there's, like, I mean, people get book deals in different ways. I mean, my colleague just has got a, just recently got a book deal for the reporting she's done on TikTok for the last 18 months. And, like, she's put in beat reporting on TikTok for 18 months. And, like, that's, that's like, a... She now has like a full basis of work to build up a, th uh, a book deal. I mean, to, you know, build up the framework of a book. Mm -hmm. We had, we're told that the, the 3,000 word story that we wrote was the framework of our book. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden we've gone, I mean, we were obviously juggling a you know, dozen stories at the time or whatever you're doing. And, and so all of a sudden this was going to become our life for the next two years. <laughs> and we had to also then think about whether this was a story that we felt was important enough, was compelling enough, one that we wouldn't lose interest in and that we would love. And like, you know, in the rearview mirror, we both learned that this is a story that we've both been obsessed with um, and just has been an incredible experience. Um, but I think that we, we also didn't know, like, if we were gonna be, uh, we've written 3,000 word articles, we'd never written a book. So like, could we even know how to like structure a narrative and make, a reader stay with us for 350 pages like I don't want to write a shit book so like you know these are all like questions that we were just like like and I feel like a lot of journalists always have either imposter syndrome or like can we do this and you always just end up buckling up and doing it but like there was a big there was a, there was a conversation we had to have yeah so how did you reconcile with that? How did you move forward to the next Just so let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, it was David who was like, I don't think these opportunities happen very often, mm -hmm. and I think we should do it. I was more on the fence than he was, yeah. but he was the one that was like, what do we have to lose? Mm -hmm. So we did it. Yeah. So when you started out reporting on the book, how did your process differ from that of a journalist writing a news story to that of a new author trying to write a novel? We just had so much more time. Like the, I, the fact that we knew we had book leave and that we could travel to places to report and stay there for really as long as we wanted, that's such a luxury. Like you don't really get that very often, if at all, in news stories. Um, and so. We decided to spend um, about a month in downtown Vegas. We rented a, an apartment that Tony lived in. Um, and, building, yeah. sorry, an apartment building that Tony lived in. Um, and then we spent about two weeks in Park City. Um, and then he went to Connecticut, um, which is uh, the place where Tony passed away. Um, and I'm based in the Bay Area, so uh, that's just where Tony grew up. Um, but I think also there was a big there was a big question about how we were going to um, sort of build the process around around writing it. Like yeah. I remember before we started, like so the book deal came through together in December, uh, and then we also heard that there was this other book that came out was going to be coming out as well. And so we realised the first thing we needed to do was get to Las Vegas ASAP and talk to as many people as possible so that you know we could get as much information as possible. But the thing that was even more crucial than that was writing some kind of chapter outline before we went there so that we knew some of the characters and the players and the questions that we were going to go in so that we could, we weren't just going to be meandering around Vegas for a month. We could like fill out what places to fill in and um, what, how to get information that would drum up certain parts of the story. And that was something. Yeah, we just did a, a lot of pre-reporting to then make sure that we had a compelling narrative that we could unspool. Can you pick apart those like game plan kind of strategizing conversations that you had? How did you navigate that? How did you begin? Where did, how did you know where to begin? Well, with downtown Vegas, it was very much like a geographical um, separation. Like, we essentially divided downtown Vegas um, into two halves, and then David took one side, 
and I took the other side. But door knocking. And, and then we just on every, knocked on uh, every business door, talked to the business owner, um, apartment buildings. A lot of it was like empty parking plots of land, and so we went there and we took photos, and so it was very much like a geographical divide. But also, also that we could use that that initial door knocking exercise that then led to human chain links. Mm -hmm. What was the Vegas connection to the story? The Vegas connection was that uh, he moved Zappos from San Francisco to Vegas in 2003 or four, mm -hmm. and then in 2000 and um, he sold Zappos to Amazon for a billion dollars in 2009, and the story of Tony is that he could only sort of go bigger. And so he decided he built one billion dollar company. He wanted to build ten more. So he's going to create his own city in a decrepit part of downtown Las Vegas, and spend half a billion dollars creating this startup tech utopia. And so it was kind of a remarkable experiment. It's very sad today because not much of it exists and it's all sort of wilted away. But like he started a very famous music festival there. There was businesses that did grow up to be billion dollar companies. Um, and he started dozens of bars, restaurants, bought a thousand apartments and just filled them with people. So he did create like a whole ecosystem in downtown Las Vegas to bring a piece of Silicon Valley out there. And so that's where his wonderful, zany, crazy experiment took place. And we, we learned that actually it came with... The whole message of, the, of this ecosystem was underpinned by an idea that everything could be achieved with more happiness and chasing happiness. And you can't build a town or a city or a community with that as the goal because we document there were suicides, there was all sorts of nasty stuff that occurred. And it just was a flawed thing. And that preceded his last tragic year in uh, Park City when he was surrounded by yes men. That's, that's the book. <laughs> Do you want to explain that a little bit more? You say he's, he was surrounded by yes men during his descent. What, what do you mean by that? Yeah, so uh, COVID settled in, um, but basically by the end of 2019, he'd become pretty afflicted by uh, drug addiction and mental health issues and alcoholism. Um, his experiment in downtown Las Vegas, had, as I said, wilted away and sort of sh shriveled up and everyone was fighting and he was just like, get me the hell out of here. So he went to Park City where he'd been to Sundance every year. He spent about $100 million on, on these mansions in this one little ritzy neighborhood says, come with me, everyone. Like, he's, what's that famous, who's the Pied Piper? Peter, Peter, anyone? No, I'm thinking of the guy who... Yeah, Pied Piper, yeah. Yeah, Pied Piper, Piper. I'm thinking of metaphors as I'm talking. <laughs> and so basically, he goes out to Park City, about several dozen people following him out there, and all of a sudden, this experiment he'd had in downtown Las Vegas becomes a very dark experiment in Park City. And, you know, there's rampant drug use, people are taking, finding reasons to bill him for tens of millions of dollars for nonsensical things. He's buying like hot air balloons and all sorts of wild stuff at the same time that he's going through psychosis and people are taking advantage of him through that. So there's some pretty dark scenes mm. from that. And where did the psychosis come from? Um, I mean, so, his friends told us that they believed that it was a, and his, and his family through court documents said that they believed that it was a drug-induced psychosis. Mm -hmm. um, he had started experimenting with uh, ketamine um, in the last year and a half of his life. He got exposed to ketamine um, at Burning Man, um, and he was told that this was a miracle drug that cures all ills and you'll never get hungover, and it's just the happy drug. And for somebody who was so obsessed with happiness, wrote a whole book called Delivering Happiness, this was the drug for him. Um, and so he started doing a lot of um, ketamine and he just started exhibiting behaviors that we document in great detail in the book that really alarmed a lot of his close friends. Um, and some people thought that, you know, this is Tony Shea, he'll, he'll, he'll think out of this um, because they assumed that he was so wealthy and so I guess book smart that even if he was addicted to a drug he can think himself out of it 
Um, and then there were other folks who really did try to get him into rehab, and there was a group of friends who were successful in getting him into rehab, but that lasted for only a week and a half, two weeks, and Tony immediately left. Um, and so when it comes to like, what caused the drug-induced psychosis, we found that it charted back to ketamine. Mm -hmm. um, but that was a stroll. Yeah, but you know, it kind of goes a, a, a little bit um, farther than that. I mean, I don't think we don't think it's a coincidence that you know Tony in his twenties sold his first startup to Microsoft for hundreds of millions of dollars. In his thirties, he sold Zappos to Amazon for a billion dollars, and this happened in his forties. And in the last year of his life, he was constantly thinking about that next success story, that next venture that would take him to the next level. And so it's just not a coincidence, a coincidence that his downfall happened in this decade of his life when the previous two decades had just been nothing but success for him. Mm. I remember a scene in the book where Jill, the singer, is talking to Tony about his definition of success. and. She can't, I, I believe she couldn't remember what her answer was, but she remembers what his answer was. And he said, having the willingness to lose it all. And I really thought about that a lot. And I was wondering, you know, is that fatalistic? Is that profound? Is that cliche? What do you think that tells us about Tony, that his definition of success was a willingness to lose everything? I reckon our take on that would be different. Like, I, I, I just would be, I'd take a cynical route there and be like, a lot of things Tony said were pretty blatant cliches. You know, a lot of quotes that were attributed to him that were like on walls around like Las Vegas were just other people's quotes. Like, there was, I mean, he, like he wrote a book called Delivering Happiness and he came up with these four genius ways of how you're going to like subsist on happiness. Mm. And like, I don't know, I just did, didn't buy it. Like, you know, it wasn't something that I I thought was, like, revolutionary or anything. He just read a lot of other texts on happiness and then put, put them in his own book and then had a memoir angle. And so I think that, like, that particular quote, I think that he probably had... He was very well read. So I Googled it. He didn't steal it from anybody. Yeah, well... <laughs> yeah. What about know. you, Andrew? What do you think? Yeah, I... I think I'm going to try to answer your question in a roundabout way, so I'm going to preface it with that. Um, you know, I think with Tony, it's, it's really easy to come up with all the reasons to write about a hero, mm -hmm. but Tony was not a hero. He's very clearly an anti-hero in this book, um, but the reason why we <laughs> write about figures like this is because more often than not, anti-heroes show some symptoms of some kind of malaise in society. And so that's what made him so interesting for us to write about. Not necessarily because he tried to espouse happiness, not because he had this tragic downfall. It's because of what happened to him is very emblematic of what our society um, believes in and prioritizes and thinks is successful. And what he said about willing to lose it all, I think that was, that was something that he prided himself in in being, even if that wasn't necessarily true. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, he chose to live in a trailer park versus buying a private island in, I don't know, in the Caribbean and building a massive mansion there. And so the idea that he sort of eschewed all these normal um, symbols of uh, success, that to him was an example of him, you know, willing to lose it all. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I don't know. I mean, I think that was like one thing that was really fascinating about the reporting. It was who Tony thought of, uh, who Tony thought he was himself, was very different from who he actually was. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and that level of self delusion is, I mean, it's sometimes it's required for successful entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. there are some pretty dark scenes in the book. One stood out to me, it was during the, the bus trip to Montana. Can you describe what happened in that scene? What was going on on the bus? Yeah. Um, so this is again in the like the last year of his life and he was sort of toggling between sobriety and ketamine use and I 
think he was still drinking at that point. And a lot of his, yeah, he was doing a lot of uh, shrooms. And a lot of his friends had been looking forward to this annual July 4th trip that they often did, going out to uh, a lake in Montana. And um, so they thought that it might be a good opportunity to get him away from Park City and then also just give him some breathing space to be around good people and a good vibe. And so effectively they get on this bus because he only travelled around in like tour buses, basically. So they all get on this bus and it was clear when he got on the bus that he wasn't well. Like he got on, was wearing no clothes. I think he had like underwear on. He had a bag of crayons in his hand. He'd been drawing on, drawing on himself, and he gets on the bus and he starts just like verbally abusing everyone on the bus and making like crude jokes. And then he ends up uh, going. He, I think, oh, what happened? He gets angry at everyone. And then he goes to bed. And the next morning, there, because it's an overnight bus to Montana, they're going to arrive, you know, first thing in the morning, and they go up to go wake him up because he had told one of his friends, I'll pay a million dollars if you wake me up at 9 a.m. And so the friend goes to wake him up, and he doesn't get up. So then, all of a sudden, Tony starts screaming and from within the bedroom on the bus. And he says, um, you know, get another man on the bus whose name is Justin. And effectively, what happens is Justin walks in to his bedroom, and he sees that... Tony has been sitting in the shower for hours. The entire drain, uh, tank is empty, basically. And there's a horrendous smell coming from the bathroom. And um, Tony basically says that he has figured out a way to cure COVID. And there's two other delusional things that he says. And he says, I can do all the things I just told you, but I need more shrooms. And Justin tells him... I will not do that. And he's, t Tony ends up saying, I'll give you half of my net worth if you get me shrooms, which is at that point about half a billion dollars. And uh, it's a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, then, um, but basically Justin ends up getting off the bus and Tony proceeds to trash the bus while it's parked in this hotel uh, parking lot and their whole point is to keep him on the bus so the public can't see him. He's trashing a bus people go on to try to talk to him he tells one girl that he wants to get everyone on the bus and have everyone commit suicide together um, and he'll some, bring them back to life and he'll bring them all back to life And so it's just a really horrific and terrifying scene basically um, of just a a tech visionary in this state. It's not something you typically mm -hmm. can ever like put in the same room or the same mind, uh, frame of mind. So, I guess like that was a, and we wanted to go into every detail on that. And the reason why it was important to go into every detail on that was because I think that we had so many conversations around what was exploitative mm -hmm. and what was not. And I think. You know, it's one thing to say that the people who were there and who saw this behaviour, the ones who recounted this to us, and their reasoning for recounting us, recounting it to us, was to say that Tony would have wanted this. He would have wanted radical transparency about what had occurred here, and that you could use it as a learning point. A cynical take on that would be that these people wanted to clear their own names as being there and being party to this. And I think that we could also see that that was. A motivation but whichever way the information was the information that we had and if we wanted to document exactly who was there what situation Tony was in and then who continued to take his money in the months after this event knowing these things had happened that was crucial for us to like allow readers to make their decision on what they should take away from this period of his life that was why that's what informed our decision to really go pretty nasty mm -hmm. on that. So what could the, those people have done? I mean, I'm, it's more of a question for a lawyer than for a journalist, but could they have had him involuntarily committed to save his life? I mean, what could they have done? I mean, so um, from what we understand, um, the family was looking into putting him into a conservatorship. Mm -hmm. um, and there were efforts from various friends to try to get him committed to 
rehab. They sent different doctors to the property that he was staying at in Park City. Um, but none of it worked. And after Tony's passing, one of the friends said to us, you know, maybe if we had just all worked together instead of working in, um, in silo. And there, were, and there was a lot of reasons why the friends were, why a lot of friends in the family, they were working in silo. They weren't talking to one another. They all had different motivations for why they were even around Tony at the time. Um, and, and this one source said to us that we had just all come together and like pulled together our effort and resources to actually get Tony the help that he needed maybe he would still be alive. So but, I think like that show intervention, like everybody comes together. To, right, you know. but it's hard, to, it's hard to stage an intervention on one of the wealthiest people in the world. Think about like all the resources that he must have had at the time. Especially when he has people next to him who are on his payroll, whose right. interests are to keep him. Right, and it's complicated, right? You need lawyers and you need doctors to sign off on this. It's exactly. And he was moving from state to state. So you need a lawyer and a doctor in each state. Right. And yeah. so the family, they were actually in the process of finding doctors and lawyers in uh, Park City, Connecticut, Vegas. But he was moving around constantly in the last couple of weeks of his life. So last couple months. Um, so yeah, I mean, what could they have done? You're right. Um, Maybe they could have done more and it still wouldn't have done anything. Um, but there are some sources who think that if they, if they had done things differently, maybe he would still be alive today. I want to understand your reporting process with that like inner circle around Tony that was there and witnessed his deceit. Because you mentioned that they were incentivized to kind of keep him in the state almost. They were getting a lot from him, a lot of money in some cases. And how did you go about reporting and interviewing those people. They were described, you know, by Joel and yourselves in the story as yes men. People who would just agree with everything Tony wanted, even though they knew that he wasn't right in his mind at the time. So how did you not be manipulated by them or kind of allow them to sugarcoat what happened during those periods and really get to the truth of what happened? I would say that having Angel as a partner and thought partner was incredibly important. I mean, I think yeah, that we had ditto, it. Yeah, ditto, vice versa. But it was incredibly, like, it was actually, like, I feel like most people in this room, we always are dealing and trying to figure out what people's motivations are. We're always trying to figure out what everyone's angle is. We're always trying to figure out, like, why is this person telling me this insanely damning thing that is it seems against their interests? There's always a reason why people are doing that. And this was like that on steroids, because these people knew this book was going to come out, there was going to be another book coming out, there was reporting that was coming out, there was going to start shining spotlights on different people, and there was a rush almost for people to get their own narratives forward. Mm -hmm. And so I would come back from some interviews and be like, I just got this like insane account, first-hand, blow-by-blow of what had just occurred, and it just shows this is the villain. And then Angel would come back and be like, well, actually, I just had this interview who said this entirely opposite thing. Mm -hmm. And through months of re-interviewing, through months of like sitting down with people over hours and getting, holding what they had said to us six months before and then seeing if they'll say the same thing again, mm -hmm. those things always changed. And so like that was one huge dance of it. And I think that, you know, it was definitely helped a lot by the fact that we could. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, there was a lot of mind meld that happened um, during the two years that we were reporting for this book. And um, it was actually really great that there were two of us because then we could just tackle more interviews and more sources. Mm -hmm. And the discussions that we had with one another, it was really like interrogating each other and corroborating his accounts with his, of his sources with my accounts, with my sources. And so, um, yeah, it was. I'm really glad that there were two of us because... I think if there was just one person on this story, things could have slipped through the cracks, mm -hmm. or that one person's bias would have affected some kind of a judgment on a character. Mm -hmm. So um, we really tried to hold each other accountable, and we fact-checked each other, mm -hmm. and corroborated each other with each other's sources. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. There's an, a really illuminating quote towards the end of the book by a friend of Tony's who is anonymous, and he says, um, the king had no clothes and the sycophants wouldn't say a fucking word. I wonder, these yes men that we're talking about, 
how do you think they feel reading your story and reading it in that level of detail and reading that some people are describing them like this now? One of the sources actually um, reached out after the book came out and she said, she actually had mentioned this during the interviews before the book came out, but after the book came out, we had another conversation. And she said it was, the way that she described it was that it was like groupthink. Mm. Um, when you're in it, you don't realize how insane it is that all these behaviors went unchecked. Mm -hmm. um, and it's only like after the fact when you read it in, in as objective of a storytelling as you can make it. Um, I think she was also pretty surprised as to how it came across. Mm -hmm. um, but I actually like think that some people still, who we kind of, like I think there was one person we mentioned in, in the book, had moved uh, and moved into one of these like $15 million mansions, I think rent free, mm -hmm. with her family, took her kids in there and everything. And like, I saw her not long ago, mm -hmm. and like, I don't think that she sweats it at all. Like, I don't think, there's a lot of people who like think, that was a crazy time. Yeah. That was like a wild thing to be a part of, mm -hmm. but uh, like they don't feel a single sweat for any potential culpability they had. Maybe that's their way of dealing with it, but mm -hmm. there were so many people who just, it was surprising at how eager they were to shirk responsibility mm -hmm. for like an incredibly tragic thing that they played a part of. Mm -hmm. And that's just, that's just what a lot of human, some humans can be like, you know, mm -hmm. like, what's well, how some people deal with things, mm -hmm. you know. So ultimately you guys told this, this story in great detail and the takeaway is there were no real heroes or villains to what happened. Do you feel like looking back that you should have laid the blame or like against certain people or said something going beyond that there are no heroes or villains? No. I think that's not our job. Our job as reporters is to lay out the facts, mm -hmm. make sure that they're, they are as accurate as possible and give readers the room to make the judgment call. Um, there are some books that are that exist out there that do make those judgment calls, but mm -hmm. we made a conscious choice to not do that for this book. Um, if we wanted to write another kind of book, then we could write another book. Mm -hmm. um, but for us, it was it was a very conscious choice to not do that and to just present the facts, work on making them as accurate as possible. Um, and if the readers want to decide whether a character is a hero or a villain, give them the room to do that. Mm -hmm. I think also, though, the reason why we were hypersensitive to that, like, I think Walter Isaacson, if you spend two years with Elon Musk, you should make some determinations on what you think of that. Mm -hmm. Like, we didn't get to spend a second with Tony. Mm -hmm. And what we did do is spend a lot of seconds with all of his friends who had all different accounts of what his life was. Of Like, we had six or seven, eight, nine, ten people tell us that, that he was their best friend. Or they were his best friend. And so, like, why we were so hypersensitive to not coming in and being like, this person took $20 million from him, they should be condemned to hell. Mm -hmm. Like, we didn't do that because there was actually, they weren't the only person who had acted in that way, right. who had actually done some good as well throughout the story. Mm -hmm. And, you know, his brother is a deeply polarizing figure in our book. There's a pretty terrible scene at the start of it where his brother is where Tony is dying in a stretcher and his brother starts filming him. It's a very vivid scene at the start of the book. And it sort of sets up this question about, like, what is the brother's motivation? You learn that the brother had supplied him with drugs and alcohol during the psychosis period and taking a massive salary. That is a very... Um, that is a very... Uh, it's, it's a very polarising set of facts. But there's a number of explanations that were presented to us that we didn't get to speak to him, mm. that were presented to us, that we had to lay out and say, this is what we found. Mm. Now you guys can read between the lines. And there was just so much of, so, like that was, that's one person, one character. Right. There were so many characters that had a few split hair ends on what had motivated them. Mm -hmm. 
that we didn't feel qualified to just drum down. Right, drum it down. wasn't black or white, there's a lot of gray. No. Yeah. yeah, I think one of the other really remarkable things about this book is you tell his entire life story and yet you didn't speak to anyone from his family. What did it feel like to write such a personal story of one man's life and not have input from the family? Was that something you struggled with? Well, we told the family, um, we were in contact with the family's lawyers mm -hmm. and we told them, listen, we're working on this book. We would love to interview any members of the family, whether it's the father, Richard, or any of the bro brothers, Andy or Dave. Um, and we were told that the lawyers essentially were advising the family to not grant any media interviews mm -hmm. until the estate had settled. Right. Because um, there were folks who were suing the estate with um, various creditors' claims, and it's still not settled yet. Um, but then we were also told by a source that um, there are all these people that are suing the estate for money and presenting their account of what happened um, in the last 12 months when they made these business dealings with Tony. And the family is going to respond mm -hmm. with their version of the events of what happened the last 12 months. Mm -hmm. And that filing from the family is going to be, in some way, their way of speaking to the public. Right. So we tried to incorporate as much as we could from those documents into the book to what we think was the most representative of the family's voice mm -hmm. in the family's perspective at the time. Um, and in terms of fact checking, we sent them Extent, I mean, we. every reporter should obviously bend over backwards to make sure the source has every opportunity to comment on every allegation, and we did that with the family. Um, but in terms of how it felt, I mean, of course it would have been great if the family had participated in the book. Mm -hmm. um, Do you know if they've read it? I don't know. We don't know. I, th I think, though, that like it actually made us work harder. Mm -hmm. Right. And yeah. better mm -hmm. to try and because we were so committed to like the thing that was going to be important to us with this book was just I mean it's it's a fact that like everyone's childhood often informs a lot of their adulthood and we wanted to understand what shaped this this man mm -hmm. and so without his family we were like okay well what the hell do we do now let's call so then we started going back and we were just yeah. we started with yeah. a lifelong friends and the lifelong friends know the elementary school friends who have the yearbooks which we could quote from. Mm -hmm. And you know this, like when you don't have access, the story oftentimes becomes better because mm -hmm. you have to think of other ways to gain access. And that's usually the unvarnished version of mm -hmm. the truth. That's Whereas, what I felt reading it. I yeah. felt like it was incredible that I have his entire life like mapped out before me and yet it didn't come from his family. It came from you piecing it together like a big jigsaw puzzle. Um, one of the things we're not used to as reporters writing news articles is having reviews done of our work or like critics of our work and I wonder what it felt like to read the reviews of this book in publications like the New Yorker and the New York Times was that quite disarming <laughs> and confronting seeing people write about your work in that way yeah, <laughs> yeah. do you want to explain why well, we knew the Times one was coming. Mm -hmm. um, the New Yorker one, we did not know it was coming. Um, and but wait, the, the, the interesting thing about this... Do we know this, about the New Yorker one? No, right? No, I think that like the, pu the publicists know. have been like, we sent it to the New Yorker. Right. <laughs> but, yeah. but, but I think that the, the interesting takeaway from those two specific reviews was the uh, Alan Barry at the Times had said that we hadn't... Um, we, should, we hadn't assigned blame. Yeah. That, I mean, she said a lot of nice things and... Uh, a lot of other medium things, and then but she ended it saying we should have assigned blame, and that was like our role as reporters. But then um, the New Yorker, Jay had said that we should have more closely interrogated Tony mm. and assigned blame to him, mm -hmm. and so it was just. I thought it was so interesting yeah. and great that we got those two responses because to me that meant that we did our jobs right. The fact yeah. that we got these different responses and they were conflicting. Yes, because yeah. that was. That was the goal all along, to, uh, to again, give the readers the room to interpret these facts. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, yeah, they wanted us to place more blame, but I was like, hey, like, I think we accomplished what we like, set out to do, set out to do right. when right. we read these reviews. Um, and yeah, the FT gave a really nice review. Yeah. Um, 
But no, it is, it, to answer your question, yeah. it is weird. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was very weird. I did not to read it. it happen. One of the things in the New Yorker review, they said that um, while they said your reporting was meticulous, and also said that while his descent into addiction and his untimely death was tragic, they didn't find much to admire about Tony himself. I was quite surprised reading that, and I wondered if that's how you wanted your readers to feel about Tony, that they didn't admire him. I think that was one takeaway that was possible from it. Mm -hmm. um, he also called Tony a raging narcissist, and I don't think that that was ever a word that Angel and I had ever shared, talking about Tony. Yeah. I think socially awkward, mm -hmm. I think like potentially, you know, I mean, there's all sorts of different ways to describe him, but narcissism wasn't really a chat until obviously he had his descent, which seemed yeah. driven by narcissism, right. but it seemed drug fueled. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't know, I'm not a psychologist either. Mm -hmm. Throughout the course of your reporting, did you find that you came to grow to admire Tony or to pity him? How do you feel about him? I felt sad for him. Mm -hmm. um, I felt that I, it, I think it's a shame that he died so young. I think that there was a lot more left for him to do that he wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, but somewhere along the way, his vision of what happiness meant got corrupted. Mm -hmm. And it led him down a really dark path that was clearly impossible to turn around. Um, I don't think I necessarily admired him. I actually think that I learned what happiness n is not mm -hmm. by re reporting on the book. And, um, you know, we've said this before, it, Tony's definition of happiness, especially towards the end, was adding, adding, adding to his life, whether that meant buying properties in Park City, <coughs> or doubling everybody's uh, highest W-2, or making new friends that would just say yes to him. And um, I think happiness is not about constantly adding to your life. It's more about just taking stock of what is and realizing that it is enough. Mm -hmm. But Tony did not think that way. And I think like it's so tragic because you talk to all of his friends and they all say like Tony was more than enough of a person. It just seemed like he didn't feel that way, so he kept on adding to his life. And so, I don't necessarily think I found admiration for him reporting the book. I felt sad for him, mm -hmm. and I learned lessons from him. Um, it was a cautionary tale, mm -hmm. in my mind. Mm -hmm. um, how do you feel about it? Yeah, I just, I think I felt like a fair bit of pity, because, like, I also just think he was afflicted by very mundane things that a lot of us go through but just the money aspect of this man's life just like totally put him under a delusion and those around him that he was different like and that seemed very key like he was sober until he was like 24 he never he was a total teetotaler until he was like 24 he then makes 30 million dollars and that's when he starts drinking Every relationship after the age of 24, when he's like got more money than most lifetimes need. Mm -hmm. And then every relationship after that had the question of money in between it. And yeah. that, that is like a terrible tragedy because... It's a power imbalance that you kind of can't escape when a lot of money is involved. Yeah. And since 22, 23, Tony had that imbalance in every single relationship that he had, whether it was with his family or romantic partners. And one of his friends told us, like, if you really hate somebody, help, if you really hate somebody, help that person win the lottery and announce it to the world. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And I really think with Tony, that was exactly what happened. Um, every single relationship that he had was impacted by how much wealthier he was right. than other people. And, and unlike a lot of really wealthy, successful people, rather than surrounding themselves with other really wealthy, mm -hmm. successful people who may have similar experience, he clung on to this like idea of the first time he was ever happy was when he went to Harvard University, was in his dorm, made his first true friends, had freedom from his parents, it was a very restrictive upbringing. He was purely pure joy then. So for the rest of his life, he clung to that feeling. And that also meant that while he was making hundreds of millions, billions of dollars, he was clinging on to like trying to like get this like childish wonderment of new friendship with laymen and lay people. And that was a that was something that you just was not ever going to be able to be achieved.
Yeah. Does anyone have any questions? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Quickly, my understanding, you said that the first murmurs about Tony's problems began to come, came, uh, come out after he died. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. You started to dig. And the thing that strikes me, I want to get down to what was the image of him before that? And also, why were reporters, why didn't they get beneath the veneer, you know, before that and see some of the problems? That's a really good question. Um, so up until 2015, 2016, Tony was kind of, um, he was a tech darling. So publications like Vox, TechCrunch, Recode, they all covered him pretty widely. But um, David mentioned um, how in the book we talk about uh, down, the pitfalls of Downtown Project, which is the project that he created in downtown Vegas to revitalize the neighborhood. Um, when bad publicity started coming from that project, which was brought on by a string of suicides and layoffs that he had to implement in that project, um, bad press started happening and then he started retreating. Um, he started not doing as much press as he used to. Uh, there's an interview, you can still Google it on YouTube, of Kara Swisher interviewing Tony Shea during a Recode conference, and it was an incredibly uncomfortable interview. Um, he just, he did not want to be on that stage. And so he retreated, and I think because of that retreat, the press lost interest, the, the in, press him. Lost interest in him, and just, they didn't cover him as much. And so um, it, was, it was around the time when the press didn't cover him as much, that was when he started um, experimenting more with different drugs, drinking more. Some of his colleagues noticed jaundice, which is a symptom of alcoholism. It was really during that last of 2010s when that really just it's also up. not. It's also not like Zappos was getting in the news for like labor violations yeah. or like, it was just a boring shoe e-commerce company that had- Part of Amazon. Yeah. Part of Amazon. Like it wasn't like committing fraud or mm -hmm. anything like that. So like, there just wasn't a news cycle for it. And yeah. His zany experiments that had made him newsworthy were starting to die off. So, yeah. Do you also think the pandemic? The pandemic. Oh, you know, he was sure. isolated. I mean, the pandemic is the reason you could say that he descended so rapidly. Right. Mm -hmm. But it's also like during the pandemic, we were not thinking about what Tony Shade was up to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Larry? So how did he actually die? Sorry? How did he actually how die? How did he actually die? He died of carbon monoxide inhalation. So he had been um, he'd been at a friend's house in Connecticut, New London, and um, they had been. It was really cold, and he'd had an argument with his ex girlfriend who was there, whose house it was. And he said, "I'm going to go to sleep out on the beach in the backyard." And then she said, "No, you're not." And so then they had an argument, and. The compromise was that he was going to sleep in the shed attached to the side of the house. And it was like minus two. To, what's this freaking Fahrenheit? It was cold. It was really, really cold. Minus two. It, it was, was below <laughs> freezing. It was, it was below November freezing. Yeah. It was below freezing. And uh, he was out. Uh, and he went into the shed. And his assistants kept bringing him like uh, whippets, which are the, the no. nitrous oxide inhalation, and weed, and. Uh, other sort of drugs and pizza and so many candles. And then the last thing they brought in there was a propane heater. And it's not clear. We spoke, we interviewed the fire department six different times and uh, they could never quite determine exactly what ignited the propane heater. It could have been all the candles that were around. It could have been the fact that he was lighting Ziploc bags on fire to keep himself warm. But what was clear was he locked himself in the shed don't know why. He was totally out of it. Like, he was totally... Um, so he inadvertently killed himself. That would be the most safe explanation, yeah. And so, he, but he didn't... He did not burn. His body was not burned. They got it out before it was burned, but the shed had been filled with smoke. That that was what ended up what giving him brain damage, and they turned the life support off a week later. Um, two questions, if I can. One, how do you know when a business story is better told as a human story? Um, and then two, what was the editing process like? Like, when did they get involved, um, and how was it different from working with a, a, a newspaper writer? I mean, I always think a people's story is the way to, yeah. to go into a business story. Um, I think, um, especially at a place like Forbes, Forbes is so 
it, it, it's a very profile focused establishment. And so they're always looking at a story from the lens of the founder and the CEO, whether it's they're doing a good job or they're doing a bad job. Um, and because I was there for five years, I still very much think that that is the best way into a story. It's also the most interesting part, I think, of a business story when you focus on the humans and focus, because you can talk about the corporation and you can talk about the numbers and you can talk about the earnings and revenues and EBITDA, but it all comes down to people's actions that's causing those numbers. So if you can, I would always try to turn it into a people story, even if it's a story about numbers. And the editing process, it was just, Crazy. Book, book, <laughs> yeah. book yeah. editors. Book editors are not newsroom editors. <laughs> yeah, say more. <laughs> say more. <laughs> the thing I just say is that, like, they they're more conceptual. Um, until they like they do get down and dirty and like do the line edit, but it's normally like. Well, one it, or two. Yeah, people had warned us beforehand that book editors are not going to be. As they have involved. no urgency. They're not going to be as involved as um, a newspaper editor mm -hmm. um, or a magazine editor. Um, and we found that very much to be the case. Um, we had a lot more agency over the book. And, you know, we had never written a book before. So we would turn in the pages and we'd get, like, very high-level feedback. And David and I would be like, is that it? <laughs> but but that they also were fantastic at, like, pointing out something in chapter two yes. that could be seeded in chapter two, and then you have your mind blown in chapter 23. Yeah. Because, right. and, and like that was like, a, rem that's a really great skill that we learned, was like how to build tension when, you're, when you should be posing questions, and then at what point you should be answering them, which characters you should develop. Like we built an entire chapter around his brother based on the feedback that we had had, because we need to establish him as a, like just character development and knowing that that we had set up something in chapter five and then just left it hanging and not answered it by chapter fifteen. Like these are things that like they were fantastic yeah. at. Really. Yeah, they were really great about like big picture things. And at the end of the day, like we're the reporters, we're the writers, so we need to be held accountable of how we want to structure the story, which is. I think very different from newspapers and magazines because more often than not, most magazines and most newspapers have a point of view and a tone of voice. And with the book, it's supposed to be our point of view and our voice. So I think that it took a, a second for us to adjust to that. Um, and, that and that's another reason why book editors are you know, a, a little more hands off than newspaper editors because they're giving us the room to shape the book that we want to write. Also, I think fact checking was a bit of a surprise to us yeah. as well because it was no fact checking. So I was like, <laughs> oh, we, read we thought it was like, oh yeah, the publisher will we'll fact check, but yeah, no, they don't like, no. at all. So <laughs> they were like, they were like, it's optional. So, so we, I mean, well, like, and then our agent said we should have uh, a, what's the back, the notes section where we mm -hmm. have everything appendage, but. What we decided we were going to do was just the newspaper style fact checking and we were going to do a no surprises document to every single source of consequence in in the book. And so we sent out probably about a hundred hired a we hired a fact checker to fact check our fact checking. <laughs> and we had um, we sent out about a hundred emails, some of them were like six, seven thousand words long, mm -hmm. of just every single point in the book at which this person would be mentioned or they were aware mm -hmm. of certain stuff and those were like a great resource for us yeah. to like be like the, the last uh, line of fact checking yeah. for us. But it was like very important to us that we yeah. had a bulletproof book. Right. Yeah. Was yeah. I asking them to approve their quotes or anything like that? Or? No, we had no. All, all the initial interviews had been recorded, recorded so yeah. there was none of that. Yeah. Angel, you just mentioned the difference between working for an organization, which kind of you develop the voice of the organization and then trying to find your own voice. So how did, how did you shift from being a reporter <laughs> to an author and how did you find your author voice? Um, if I'm gonna be completely frank, I think we're still working on our author voices. Um, this is our first book. Mm -hmm. um, I but I think... I <laughs> but, um, I think um, I think the reason why our book was as balanced as it was 
was because we were given the room and the authority to be balanced. Um, and that was something that I really appreciated being able to do with this book. Because um, again, like, we didn't have editors. I mean, we yeah. did have editors, but we were editing ourselves. So um, I think, uh, I think maybe what, what it comes down to it, if we were to write another book, I think neutrality is the author voice that I appeal the most to, and it was through, through <laughs> writing the book that made me realize that. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, okay. Ooh. Oh, there's a lot. Okay. Um, can you speak a little bit more about, like, how you guys co-wrote the book, if you took it on, uh, if you did sec sec sections, if you were on Google Meets together, if it was in person? I would love to hear a little bit more. Yeah. Um, so, in, as, a, as we were saying earlier, like, we had the chapter outline, so we had an idea of how that was going to how we were going to build in certain characters, certain places. But actually what like informed who was going to write what was who we spoke to. And so we would come back and we would figure out who was going to go into what chapter and where. And then before either of us would go and write a chapter, we would bullet point it out together so that there would be less surprises that I wouldn't get her Angel's copy and be like, this is terrible and not what I thought it was going to be at all it was like there was much less room for like us to get into those situations yeah, yeah, yeah. and so like it was good because then we could both work within a, a framework and then we would edit each other's stuff um and there was a lot of like situations as well where we would have there's like a whole chapter there uh about the, about how gentrification occurs and so we did a lot of these sort of like let's take a walk through this research topic. And like, so like, you know, I did that with gentrification and then Angel like slotted in some of the voices from her people into those sections. And then we would edit each other. And yeah. You did the same thing with like the history of ketamine. Mm -hmm. And it was just like, it was a similar situation. Yeah, so. yeah. So we would, uh, yeah, we would write and then edit each other. Okay. That's the simple way to answer yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, um, so first of all, I, I really love the beginning of the book because he's such a little superhero, um, and I, I like that contrast. And so, I, first of all, I'd love the title, and congrats on, on the book. But my, my question is, um, what would you ask him, uh, Tony, if, if he was here? Maybe what would you ask him, at, you know, closer when he was 24, and what would you ask him, you know, in the last few weeks of his life? And this is a question for each of you, so. <laughs> um. For the last couple weeks of his life, I would just ask him, what are you looking for? That's exactly what I was about to say. Because he was, he was clearly searching for something. Yeah. So what is it that you're looking for? And maybe how do I help you get there? Um, and make it very clear that I don't want any money out of this. Like, I just want to help. Um, and then when he was in his 20s, um, Hmm. What would I ask him? Um, I would ask him I why. Think, like, like, are you happy? And if if so, why? Uh, I feel like when you're 20, like you're just like chasing the next high. Like, well, that's, you're that's just chasing true. the next big thing. Like you're yeah, like yeah. looking like, oh, I'm gonna go to uni, university next year, or like I'm gonna distract myself with this activity. Like you're like a puppy running around. Totally. Like, Maybe hopefully by the time you're 30, you're asking some introspective questions. But yeah. Maybe I'm speaking for myself here. Maybe I wasn't asking any <laughs> introspective questions. We've only got a few minutes left, so we'll get to the last questions. Yep. Uh, so it sounds like the people of Las Vegas, in a way, are the losers of the story because they didn't get the benefit of whatever you might have created there. So I'm just wondering the wealth that passed on from him to the relatives or the uh, people who were the heirs. Is any of that going to any good um, social purpose? So right now, I mean, after he died, so he died without a will, and so that led about half a dozen people to file some pretty wild creditors' claims against the estate, which is they've been still fighting that. Uh, one of them, one of the women, uh, Mimi Pham, she had claimed that she was owed 120 million dollars, and then ended up paying 
a million to settle the case. So some really bizarre stuff like that. But um, the community he built there and spent half a billion creating is a shell of itself. I just had a call with someone yesterday who told me that there's three new restaurants shutting down, like the mm -hmm. Thai shut down and stuff like that. And and um, so the, the neighborhood that he built is like a shell of what it once was. But what is a fascinating thing is that a mile down the road, half a mile down the road, is a place called the Arts District. And that is a thriving, vibey, hipster place right now that almost anyone you ask will say it would not have existed had he not done his wild experiment up further downtown. And now there's this like place that's like full of bars. And the big difference is he's downtown Las Vegas was funded by a single person and that meant that everyone was asking the same hand for money. This arts district is an entirely organic enterprise of businesses and people just creating a mini neighborhood in the way that neighborhoods are supposed to be created. Mm -hmm. So that's a really interesting sort of takeaway. And then right at the back. remember how we organized it. I think there was, it was very chaotic. But actually, we had a Google Drive, and there was like a folder for each source. I did all the folders. I, I can't say I was very good at adding to. Um, but yeah, we had like a Google Drive. And whenever we wrote chapters, we wrote it in a Google Doc. So that's like a live document where we both could access, and we could see what the other person was doing. But in terms of note taking, I mean, again, like we're different reporters. Um, mine, I was, I, it was pretty chaotic. Like I, I had recordings. I had notebooks, like moleskin notebooks. Um, I had notes, in Microsoft Word. I had notes in Google Docs. Um, it was. My record was there has to be. Yeah, I'm sure Dave was. I think there there has to be a better way. That I I'm not. I'm still person. working on yeah, it. Yeah, I, I, I shouldn't give advice on this because my <laughs> process is chaos. Okay, one more question. Yep. Did you, uh, in all your research, did you get a lot of conflicting stories or were facts disputed? Anything like that? Yeah. Yeah, almost everyone we spoke to said. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, so I think where in the book, when there were conflicting accounts and it was a really important part of the story that we wanted to include in the book, we would say, these accounts are conflicting and present both sides. Mm -hmm. um, and and then we would try to corroborate each other. So I would talk to a source that was in the same room that his source was in, and so we would just tell each other what the sources told us and see what matched up. Mm -hmm. um, and in, Well, I think there were also like times when it was like, present both sides meant that we weren't gonna present any sides. That also happened, where we could not come to an agreement, so we just, then we had a discussion of, do we need this in the book? Does it push the story forward? If not, let's just kill it. So for those of us in the room who are interested in maybe one day writing a book, what kind of advice would you give? Do it. <laughs> but I would, um, well, I mean, there's a big question we had at the start, whether we should even do it. Mm -hmm. um, I would work hard in finding a story that you believe in whether it's for a magazine or for a newspaper, because we didn't write the story thinking it was going to be a book, mm -hmm. but it was a hell of a story. Mm -hmm. um, so if there's any advice that I would give, it's to just, it's just find a story that you really believe in, and if it warrants a book, then it'll happen. Or, like, it doesn't, like, our situation was very different. If you really believe in a story, report the hell out of it, get it published, and then send it to publishers. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a great end to note on, well, note to end on. <laughs>